Welcome, everybody. This is Internet Marketing Unleashed. I'm Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Pedology. What's your biggest business goal? And if you could get there the fastest possible way, would you do it? Oftentimes, people tell you that it's the journey. Enjoy the journey. I have to tell you, after 40 years of being on a journey, it'd be kind of nice to get somewhere. And that's what we're going to be talking today about with Jack Humphreys. He's the author of Leverage Black Book, and he's going to be talking to us about how you get your goals done quickly, particularly when they're big, audacious, hairy goals. And uh, welcome to the show, Jack. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. All right. So tell us a little bit about how we can achieve our business goals fastest in the fastest way possible. Well, uh, first, stop doing what everybody's told you to do. Just quit doing that for a second. At least put it in a little bowl and just put it over here for this 20 minutes and just forget every single thing that you know. One of the things that's really predominant in uh, the internet marketing world, and everybody is an internet marketer, even people who don't have a business, everybody puts something on Facebook to sell the idea of it to someone else, to get a reaction, to get engagement. And that's people that don't even have a product or a service. Everybody's selling all the time. So we know that. Now, the people who have put out courses to teach you how to do things like become popular and engage people and attract your ideal customer and all of that, most of those people learned how to do internet marketing wrong in the first place. But they, they had a modicum of success and thought it would be a good idea now that I've had a modicum of success to write a course about it and teach everybody how I did it wrong so they can do it wrong. Um, and what I mean by wrong is working way, 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 way too hard. And um, what most people think you have to do is create your own audience. So in order to do that, you set up your website, you go to Facebook and get an account, and then you go to Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn, and everywhere else and get an account. <clears throat> you start to put content up in the format that those third-party services enjoy, like video or audio or written and slides and everything else. And you go back then, after you've got all of that set up, you go back to your site and you start doing some content. And you might do a podcast, you might do a written article, you might do whatever. Then you take that and take it out to social. And you start by one by one trying to attract people out there. And your audience could be a potential size of millions or hundreds of thousands, or thousands, or even hundreds, but you are darn determined because of the guy who told you before that's how he did it. Never mind that he's been in couples counseling, he's got a heart stamp put in, he's overweight, and everything else because of the way he taught you how to do it, that's how he did it. And it's not only bad for your business, it's bad for your health to wait for years for your own success and to wade through trying to get people to come on board, buy your products and services. The irony of all of this is that the internet was created and technology like this is created so that we, we can automate things, so that we can um, reach the masses without shaking everybody's hand one by one as they come into your, your website with a stupid cat meme and trying to relate popular culture with your, with your three-legged stool business just so that you can get it on social to be maybe hopefully relevant to the one or two people aside from your mom that sees it every day. Yeah, so exactly. that's what everybody's learned how to do. As you were talking, I had the impression of like, I want to have a million customers. And so now I'm knocking on one door at a time a million times. And how hard and frustrating and uh, that would just be. It was just like, no, yeah, find an easier way. But a lot of people do that and they'll do it. They'll excuse what they're doing by, well, the guy that I'm following or the, the, the gal that I'm following that wrote this course said that, and, and she's really, really successful. Look at her now. And um, and good for her. And, and and most people are, are like, they don't even question what they ask you to do. And I was going to make a really funny video. I, I still might try to do it. And I hope it'll be funny to everybody else. But I'm going to, have you ever um, had, uh, y you know, you start looking around for supplements. You want a supplement to, to sure. do something that'll help you grow hair or <laughs> uh, didn't work and or anything and or just live a better life, be healthy, whatever. And all of a sudden, your Facebook feed and all the retargeting that's targeted to you and everything has got like 50 billion supplements out there. And, and if you watch Dr. Oz, 
if you took what Dr. Oz said every single show for a whole year, by the time you got done with that year, you'd be taking physically like 75 supplements every single meal time if you took his advice on every single thing. So like, I feel like that's the way that people talk about marketing now. They, if you listen to everybody, you would be, I, I was going to make a video that started at like 5.30 in the morning after having only an hour of sleep and go through an entire day of all the recommendations that everybody has on how to get attention and all the things you have to do on social media, making content, uh, re, you know, engaging people as they're, you know, hopefully saying something about your content and sharing it around, um, doing joint ventures, doing all this stuff. And by, you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock the next night. And of course I wouldn't do this in real time because <laughs> that, I think it's so crazy that I wouldn't even bother trying to do it for a whole solid day. But everybody wants you to do their method. Everybody wants you to do what they've done to succeed and they swear by it. They're like, drop everything else. Like I did just earlier, only except when I did it earlier, I was trying to drop it and I don't want you to pick that back up. At least the vast majority of what I asked you to put down, I don't ever want you, if I succeed today, to ever have to pick all that back up. So I, I'm asking you to drop it too. <laughs> I'm so happy that we're talking because it was about a week ago. Uh, somebody sent me an email and it was about, and actually it's, I'm a member of this group and it was all about the bright, shiny object. And I was so inspired by his uh, email and his video that I did my own video about bright, shiny objects. <laughs> yeah. Because we see all of these, you know, it's, it's uh, no longer ADHD or whatever it is. It's now ADSO, attention yeah. deficit. Oh, shiny object. <laughs> right, squirrel. Squirrel, that's right. And that's yeah. the problem that people have, right? It's like they, they have, they, first of all, they, they're spending all of their time learning something because it's going to take you half an hour or an hour to go through the email, to go through the product, to go through whatever it is you buy. And then... It's then it's going to take you a while to get good at it and get good habits. And what yeah. I've noticed with myself, because I, I do spend a lot of time learning, I do a lot of courses as well, that if I get a course and I don't open it and start it right now, then I'm not going to actually finish it. Right. And of course, that's the same with once I finish the course, if I don't actually implement what the person taught right away, I'm not going to actually ever do it. So then I'm on this treadmill constantly of learning new things that I don't apply, which why did I bother in the first place? Right. Yeah. Well, and so what are we here to do, really? What's our big goal anyway in the first place? What are we really here to do? Is it to consume those shiny objects and all those courses that we hate having to spend all the time on, but they promise so much? And, you know, I try to keep people focused on the biggest goal. And I've studied a lot of people who are really successful and they just kind of blow onto the scene. Like if people remember anything about when they first came in contact with such a person, it's it felt like they just blew out of nowhere, just bam. And then they were everywhere. Such a person, there's really a marker for somebody like that. And they use leverage a lot. They're not they wouldn't call themselves leveragists. They wouldn't describe what they do typically as using leverage, but it is precisely what they do. And they're so, you know, and there's a big debate right now, you know, with Mike Rowe and all those guys about whether you should do what is, you know, you're passionate about or whatever. And, and rather than get into that debate or add any, any more fuel to that fire, you do still have to have a passion for something like your passion is what carries you it, just to deliver a message. What did you make your product for? What did you create your business for? What's it supposed to be doing in the world for the people that you designed it for? And uh, if there's going to be passion there, right? I mean, it might not be something that you love to do 24 seven or whatever, but you do have to get the word out. Like there was some excitement when you started your business. What was that? How can you retap into that? And now how can you draw a more straight line between today and the biggest goal on that day when you thought of your business, when you thought of your latest product or service or whatever that sat right up in bed at the middle of the night, oh my God, aha moment. How can we connect back to that exact passion and then this being the biggest goal that you had for that particular business, if it's your main business or a product line within your business or whatever, you had a goal. It's like, wow, within a year maybe I could get from this passion, of, I've got to do this to this big goal over here like 500,000 sale in sales or 500,000 sales or whatever. 
and and just kind of clearing out all the BS, that little ball of stress that we just put down at the beginning of this, and uh, and maybe not ever having to pick that up again. The people who fly onto the scene go, I've got to get this out, and they are very clear, focused people. They they're like, I've got to get this out. I'm very excited about this, and everybody, how can I make the biggest impact I possibly can right now or as quickly as possible? So they immediately start thinking about leverage. They're like. Well, I need to get on somebody's show. I need to go call Scott and get on his show. And I got to go do this and I've got to go do that. And they are always going for the highest points of leverage around them. It's like if you're lost and there's a mountain range around you, probably one of the good things you could do is get up to a higher point and look around and be able to see where you are and get your bearings and see if there is a way to pick up the trail to where you want to go to get out. And um, some people are really natural at this. And that's why somebody who didn't, you know, you you read their interview, you watch them on TV or whatever, and they describe how they got where they are. And you're you're starting to list off all the things in that little ball that we put down earlier that they didn't do. They never even touched all this crap that you think that you have to do to succeed that they didn't even do it. They're like, wait a minute, either they're leaving this out or I'm missing something or I'm listening to the wrong people. And I would say that the latter two were the things that uh, most people have a problem with. And because some people just go direct, direct to the source. Cool. You actually reminded me of a friend of mine who does about $5,000 in affiliate commissions a month. And so I said to him, like, how did you do that? Like, how, you know, what was your whole process? And he said, well, he said, I did one video a day for 90 days. And at the end of the 90 days, my affiliate income was about three or 4,000. And I just add videos sort of, if I notice it dips down, then I just add a bunch more videos onto my channel. And so, you know, he says, I took about 10 minutes to record. I recorded for about 10 minutes and then another 10 minutes to edit it and put, you know, some text along the bottom. And then I, of course I had a description which came from the affiliate manager mm -hmm. and that was it. I said, well, like you didn't bookmark it, you didn't backlink it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Just put you it out. <laughs> you didn't do that and that and that and that. I mean, how could you possibly succeed when? And it's it sounds like he just went straight to the source. Everybody yeah. knows about YouTube, right? And everybody knows. And it's like, well, no, it's there's got to be a trick. There's got to be a trick, and it, and it can't just be YouTube. I can't just make a video and put it up on YouTube or do a a podcast somewhere or whatever. I mean. They have to be doing more. And that's your brain or your mind tricking you into thinking that things that aren't complicated are much more complicated. And it might be doing that for many, many different reasons. One is just self-doubt and, you know, you know, self-help type reasons, like something inside of you is actively fighting your success. And so your mind is really, really good at coming up with excuses for why things can't be as simple as they actually are. And so some people don't have that. They're really hungry. They're really ready to go. Not that you're not hungry, but they're really ready to go. And they're really ready to uh, get where they want to go as quickly as possible. And those obstacles just don't show up. Or if they do, they just blow through them. They don't think about it because they don't have, you know, any hangups on anything other than getting where they need to go quickly on, you know, and so they, you find if you start following those folks around and you start looking at them through the, the a leveragist's lens or lens or something like that, you'll start to see these traits are very common in people who just go out and do and go and do. And they don't have a bunch of those little steps in between. They, they just don't, they, they just get it done. Yeah. You remind me actually, cause after he told me, I said, well, I can do that. So I started making videos every day and after three days stopped mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then uh, I'm on a project with a partner of mine and I said you know we need to do daily reviews it's actually of the stock market and he says oh yeah we can do that and I said it's only gonna be like 10 or 15 minutes no problem and of course now that I have a schedule with somebody because this is the way my personality works right is uh, if I do something with somebody it's way more likely to happen than if I just do it by myself so a year later we have probably 200 review videos done out of three, well, 365 minus weekends, uh, you know, so pretty, pretty good. And of course, what's happened is we get clients and customers from the videos. Like just the other day I was telling him, I says, yeah, like this guy just emailed me and he said, oh, I really love your courses, everything else. And 
your your review videos are what did it. Like you're showing me all this stuff, and I just love it. And now we're I can't wait to follow your program. And it was just like, oh, there you go. But yeah. it wasn't like one review. We did it over and over and over, proving that the system worked just about every day that we well, it worked every day we did a review. We didn't do a review every day, but um, by just by being consistent in our efforts, it just was great. And all we did yeah. was leverage YouTube. Like, cause we didn't really, well, and there's a little tick mark on YouTube videos when you do a live video that says send to Google plus and send to Twitter. So that, uh, those are always ticked. And so that's all we did. And it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. The, the web is set up to, to, for content to be very discoverable. I mean that, you know, Google is always looking for good stuff. Um, it doesn't take but five minutes to find out what Google thinks is good stuff. And that's basically whatever Google doesn't care. First of all, it doesn't care. It only cares what, uh, other people think about your stuff. And if it can determine that other people think your stuff is awesome, Google is totally agnostic at that point. It, it knows that it's going to have the best search results when it puts that kind of content in the top 10, no matter what it is or where it is. And of course, YouTube is Google, right? Y'all know that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's all set up to be discoverable. There's not a lot of extra stuff people typically have to do. Um, and yeah, and those guys that like come out with uh, uh, tricks and things and sell courses on how I ranked in, in YouTube in the number one spot for this keyword in five minutes, that's not supposed to be news to you. You're not supposed to have to buy a course to find that out. It, that what they end up doing in a very elaborate way to make it look like the course is justifiable uh, is show you like a two second process to make that whole thing actually work that everybody that's on YouTube all the time, meaning the people who are highly leveraged thought thinkers that go directly to the source all the time, they figure that stuff out. And you would too, if you did 365 videos very early on, you'd figure out maybe if I check off this box or do this keyword here or whatever it might, you would find out through doing. It's not finding out through learning that people become successful. It's finding out through doing, always and with no exceptions. That's right. I mean, it's very, very simple. You just YouTube will tell you how many views you've got, and if you've got two, and another one's got two hundred, you figure well, out what you did there. in the one you didn't do in the other one pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So, so I mean, then then there are other things that people tell us that we have to do. Um, or, you know, it's a cultural bias, like nothing worth having is, is worth anything unless I worked really, really hard for it. Mm -hmm. So we've got these cultural things that come in. We sabotage ourselves all the time and we set up goals that we think are a good idea. Um, like, um, you know, if I keep at this and I'm not divorced and I'm not sick and I'm not everything by the end of it, this is all going to be worth it at maybe two years I'll have two years I can get this done or nine months or maybe sometimes six months is too long for some people. And the thing is, you know, uh, one of the best ways I can, I can do it in shorthand to get people to understand leverage is the people who showed up on Oprah who are now Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and all these people were absolutely nobody before they showed up on Oprah. They did some work like you have, like everybody has, like they did some work that's assumed and they're good at something now, or they're, uh, or they came up with an idea for something, or whatever. That's assumed. That has to be there before Oprah picks you up. And Oprah is just a, a placeholder for whoever in your niche has the biggest megaphone, who has the eyes, ears, and hearts of the biggest engaged audience that would be perfect to hear your message, to see your product, to to experience your service, or whatever that is, and go in and getting picked up by that Oprah, whoever that is. And it's really you know, not that difficult, but people have come up with completely wildly elaborate ways to make it very, very complicated. Like I don't, I haven't earned the right to talk to that person yet. So I'm going to have to pay, pay my dues and work really hard and put in a whole bunch of this stuff. So when I do talk to them, I can point to this great big track record. You know, it's like, well, if you got a great big track record now, how much do you need them? No. If you really have a track record, I got to jump in here because <laughs> I'm going to be part of a, a social media mastery conference. I'm going to be doing podcasting with the, mm -hmm. with the speakers. And one of the, I, should, I hate to say it this way, but, but one of the people is going to be teaching YouTube and his claim to fame is, and I'm going to totally under exaggerate it. So probably too far the other way 
is that he has 2,000 subscribers and 20,000 views. <laughs> you know, like, Whoa. Okay. You know, and I, I'm always looking at videos. Big time. <laughs> yeah, like, like three, 30 million. There was one I saw 30 million views. Of course, it was music, right? But I'm, I'm comparing what I'm looking at on YouTube and these people that have just got millions and millions of views to this poor guy who's just got a very, in my opinion, very small. It's more than what I said, but, but very small. And, uh, and then I thought, ah, like, you know, he's, he's saying, you know what, I've accomplished something and mm -hmm. I've learned something and I'm going to share that something, even if you don't think I've accomplished as much as maybe I should have accomplished just exactly what you were saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I do a lot of courses on Udemy. And so I have really stayed away from how to do a course on Udemy. I'm actually going to, I have to now because I have these people that are, are insisting that I actually do that. And, um, so I look at these other how to do courses on Udemy. And of course, the instructors brag about what they do. I've done three courses on Udemy and I've made $500 a month or $50 a month or whatever. And I'm just like, dude, how can you sell that course with that little credibility? And then, but of course, people will buy the course. And the next thing you know, he's going to make more money and he's going to have more people. And, he's, and what he learned making the course may be what those people need, right? So yeah. I know what you're talking about, like, because I that was what I was thinking. I was thinking I only have 22,000 students. Like, I don't know enough to be able to teach a course because these other guys have like a million students. And then some guy that has 500 students is doing a course. Yeah. Well, you get split into two different worlds. Once you've once you've crossed uh, crossed that threshold of of being an expert or being at least more of an expert than the average in your in your world or around you are you you start to go off in two different ways it's you the expert and you the um you know the person who's got a business and everything and then we start to think well that person's only been doing that and whatever and it took me a long time to realize and 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 i always have to make my remind myself that when people are doing that that's what we were supposed to do in the beginning too we were supposed to do that and maybe we did but now we're starting to get really proud of our track record our you know, it's like I, I got two million views on my I have two million uh, views, 22 million, 2.1 million on my YouTube. But if I told everybody what it was for, you would be like, so that's why I'm not teaching YouTube. Right. It's for a monkey video that I did for one promotion. Then it scored huge and still gets comments on um, funny money, mo funny monkey video which brought a whole bunch of people in that were not targeted in the least to the what the ad was for. They just wanted to see, and it wasn't even a monkey. It was a baby gorilla. I got everything wrong, and I got 2.1 million views on my channel. I mean, over the years, my other videos have added up to a considerable amount, but that's the, you know, it was a funny monkey video. That's the 800-pound gorilla. He probably is by now, and he's probably signing and everything. This dude put me in a stupid commercial about something irrelevant. And I'm I'm only famous because of Jack Humphrey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. So I mean, you know, we start to become really too aware. I always tell people, you know, stop taking selfies all over the internet of yourself. You um, marketers are famous for very blatantly on Facebook or other channels or whatever. Um, very obviously being too self-aware that I'm a marketer now and I'm using these kinds of words and I'm doing this kind of a post and I'm doing all of this stuff because I was told that this is what needed to be done. And if that is you and you've ever done that, stop, stop doing that because you're not supposed to look like you're marketing. You're not, you're not supposed to feel like you're marketing when you are, it's just supposed to be natural. Like I got, got to get the word out. So, you know, I had to get the word out. I, I was like, I'll make a funny month. I found this stock footage I was going through and I'm like, I saw this gorilla and, and, and I was like, that, that, that might be something. It wasn't, it, it totally backfired on me as far as the kinds of people that I attracted, but I just took action. I was just like, let's go, let's do this. Don't overanalyze and don't be taking a selfie constantly and, and going, I've, I've got my marketing hat on now because you will blow it. People can sense it. I mean, people on the internet are like sharks with blood in the water. From two miles away, they can see you coming if you are overly marketing anything. And you feel it's, it, you, can, you can see the strategy dripping off people when they do some of their postings and some of their content. And it's like, it's so blatantly and obvious that it's, and not just to experts, but to, 
the lay people. They'll come back on and they'll say that, you know, with mainly apathy when they don't comment at all or whatever, that's saying a lot more than most people do in actual comments to me. But when they do comment, they say blatantly like this is just crap. You know, go, go back to the drawing board. I'm going to stop following you if you can't do a better job or whatever. And that's very, very rare. Mostly it's just apathy, which speaks volumes. <laughs> right. So what would you suggest for people in terms of actually, you know, taking some steps to leverage themselves? I was very interested in what you said about finding the, you know, the big people in your industry and, and leveraging them. But how would you go about doing that? First, it's taking a real honest assessment of what you have. And if it really is what you are going to or you are marketing it to be, then it should pass some kind of a sniff test to an expert, a big person. If you really have that, let's say you were walking through the woods and you discovered the, the fountain of youth. How, how much of this stupid, crazy marketing that you might be doing now, all this dumb busy work and everything else, would you even do? If you, you know, now forget about the fact that you can instantly get on TV two news when you have discovered the fountain of youth. Um, but let's say it's something really, really exciting and it's not that big of a deal, but it's a pretty big deal. And you're, you're going to go sell it to people if it really truly is that exciting. And we all know that channels of any kind of content, no matter how big they are, are always in a constant search for new content, for new things to say, think Buzzfeed. I mean, it might look like they've got just ideas rolling off their tongues constantly. And it does kind of appear that way. But I assure you, they and behind the scenes of everything like a Huffington Post or anything else is utter insanity and chaos. Always scrambling to get the next thing, the next person, the next idea, the next funny video, the next insightful or entertaining video of an uh, interview of, you know, all of this stuff. There's all, they're always scrambling. And behind the scenes, it's chaos. And if you understand what, what it's like behind the cameras and behind the backstage areas and everything else, not just focus on where everybody looks like they've got everything together and they never need anybody and everybody they get is so awesome. Well, before they get those people on stage, on their podcasts or wherever, before they're awesome, they're awesome because they got there. That's the whole point. You got there. Now I'm being interviewed. And you're being awesome because you're on this show and the interview is going well and you're bringing the goods and you do have something to say, something to show the world. And, and those guys are extremely grateful. Often we will look at them and go, they've got everything together. I'm too small. There's nothing I could possibly do or bring. But wait a minute. Weren't you really, really excited about your business idea at one point? What in the light of an expert diminishes the value of what? And if, if, if your answer is nothing, then you have no excuse then to go straight to the source. And if you are intimidated by this level of a, of, of, of a show or a, um, a stage, a platform, whatever it might be, then just go down here. But you'd still be way above what, you know, starting by signing up for your social accounts and building your list one person at a time and everything. That's way, way down here off camera. And then at least you would be here. Get your portfolio set up on mid-level uh, shows and sites and guest blog posts and things like that. Build that portfolio. And only because you were too scared to do it up here. Because I would tell everybody to just go up here. That's what the ultra successful people do. Go there and then get rejected at least. And then come back and do some mid-level stuff and take your portfolio of all the things that you've done for a, a month or two and then show it to them. And then, you know, the combination will get you here. But a lot of people talk their way out of that. So you have to think like what, what I call a leveragist. And, and my partner, Gina, calls a leveragist. She's also the co-author of the book. And, um, and really look for the highest points of leverage. Always be looking for them. And if you can't hit that right now because you're not prepared in some way to do that, then at least you started there. And it's easier to come down here from there than it is to get up here from down there. From, you know, trying to make cat memes out of your content and crap. So that's really a turning point for everybody usually is, is just to start thinking, okay, somebody said it was okay. My main job for 2016 is to just let as many people as possible know it's okay to think big. It really is. Right. Yeah. You know, as I'm, as I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular project I've got. And then I thought, you know, I don't know that I feel confident enough to talk about it. So, I mean, I'm just telling you that my thought process and then it's, well, like what I need to do is sit down and have a presentation and questions that I want to be asked and answered. And 
to take people through a process. So by the end of the process, they realize, wow, like this is an amazing thing that we've got. Mm-hmm. So having your, I guess, the, when you're going to be going on to these shows is you need to have your plan of action, like what you want to accomplish on the show and how you, your basic notes that you want to cover, the high points you want to cover in your presentation. Yeah, which is meaningless unless you get it booked. You know, you don't even have to have those thoughts until you've got something booked because, you know, so there's I a definite easy book, chicken and egg thing there. If I book on Oprah in two months, I'm going to have a phenomenal presentation ready for when I show up on her show because there's yeah. no way I'm going to be embarrassed in front of 300 million people. Right, right. So that's, right. And that's the yeah. incentive to do the work. So I get what you're saying. It's like find the find the big dog and just yeah. – and if he says yes or she says yes, you got a week, or you got a day, or you got a month to get. And ready. it's a stage. It's like a it's a platform. So rather than get anybody thinking that we're only talking about radio, TV, podcast, things like it's a stage. So people who are out there engaging um, large audiences that are made up wholly or partially of your ideal prospects. Um, uh, are the place to go because it's really a time machine. What you're doing with leverage is building a time machine. In order to build what those people have right now, you're going to have to go through at least what they went through. And you might find some ways to, that they made some mistakes over the years and might be able to get there incrementally faster. That's your only other choice. And if you want, and this is how people typically come on the web and start a business. They're like, man, I really admire Scott for what he's done and the audience that he's built. I'm going to do that. And I've read, I've seen some interviews. He's given me some clues. He's got some courses and he showed me how he did it. And I'm going to take all of those pieces and put them together. And I'm going to, this is the crazy part. This is almost bordering on just plain stupid. I'm going to do exactly what he did to get where he is, which means that if he said in his interview that I started five years ago to get to this point, that you are saying you're okay with taking a five-year journey to get where Scott is without even questioning if there might be a better way or if Scott himself might recommend now <laughs> that there was a whole different way. Oh, you yeah. are muted. I'm muted because my mom just came in and I have to oh, okay. turn the light back on. Don't talk. <laughs> have thousands of people watching and now- Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> hey don't say that on the air <laughs> all right so normally uh so my mom's birthday tomorrow so i'm out here visiting her all right happy birthday so everybody's now been put on notice that you're not in your mom's basement you don't live at home <laughs> this has all been clarified good job good job <laughs> And I, the thing I wanted to add to what you said was if you'd gone through that whole process and you were going to just follow what you thought I was doing, then you would miss the things that like then if you didn't ask me, I would say probably, well, don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. And you're now going to find out the hard way that, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I shouldn't have done that. And I shouldn't have done that. Which is, yeah, that adds adds injury to the whole insult of of, of not thinking more of yourself than to just go, I'm going to do it just the way Scott did it. I want to be just like Scott. I want to build the audience that he's got in my own industry. I want to have a really successful podcast and all that stuff. And then and then just immediately start to try to figure out how to replicate, you know, through piecing those things together, not in in in, in completely in um, isolation from what you've learned in the experience. <laughs> well, you know, you bring up a great point because I'm one of these people that think when I have a problem, nobody's going to be able to figure out except me. Mm -hmm. So then I spend a month or six months or five years trying to figure out the problem. And then I turn to somebody finally and say, you know, I have this problem. And they go, talk to Jack or talk to somebody else. And then I talk to somebody else and in three minutes it's fixed. And then I go, why, <laughs> why did I waste all that time when I should have just asked Jack or I should have asked Gina or I should have, asked yeah. does anybody know what to do when whatever and yeah. of course social media everybody will give me an answer but i see that over and over and over in myself it's like oh there's just there's this problem and it's just there's no way that somebody can teach me and then i'm and i'm finally starting you know after almost 60 years 
of getting this yeah if you just tell somebody that's been there and done that they're going to give you all the tips so that you don't have to worry about that at all it looks like a big deal to me because i have no clue what i'm mm -hmm. doing but as soon as i talk to somebody that is an expert or really knows it well and they are able to impart a little bit of their knowledge and i'm willing to be open and listen to it then it's like oh mm -hmm. so easy yeah Almost every that describes almost every uh, battle I've had with a WordPress plugin, you know, um, and then going to Google to find out that, you know, I have to now learn how to ask the question in a way that it actually got answered in the way that's going to help me and not somebody else with their really, really unique situation, which is what everybody has. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just having that fight with um, it's really just a fight with yourself. So, I mean, I, I'm always just like. You know, maybe some people are are going through this catharsis, you know, or about to because they don't want to admit that they don't really have anything, right? They want to, they want, they they're starting to see there's maybe a chance that they're more excited about this thing they're doing than anybody else is, and or ever will be, and and you know, uh, and other people are afraid that's the case, and they're sitting on a gold mine, and but they are not reaching out, so they can't, they're not really giving the world a bit the ability to test. And um, a lot of people are just sitting on really brilliant stuff and they're scared to death like little mice just in the corner um, that they're going to that it's they're going to somehow be hurt by trying. Yeah. You know, the first part of what you said happened with me today. I had a, a, a new podcaster he emailed me on Udemy and he said, uh, you know, thank you very much for the course, blah, 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 blah. Here's the description. In, and we had a little bit of a conversation. Then finally, he said, here's the description of my podcast. And I said to him, uh, like, you're trying to be everybody, everything to everybody, and you're going to end up being nothing to nobody. Like, you, it was so broad. It was, it was on education. And it was like, it's going to be everything you want to know about education. And I said to him, look, who's your audience? Kindergarten teachers, elementary school teachers, high school teachers, university professors, online trainers like myself corporate trainers that go into corporations. I mean, it, are, are your, is your audience math teachers or are they science teachers or do they teach business or do they like, I said there, if you get one of these little groups, little groups, it's going to be more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. Forget about, and, and if it's everybody, nobody's going to listen because a kindergarten teacher is not going to listen to you talk to a university professor about something that's that's not at all applicable to hers. And if it's math teachers and you're talking about human resource training in a corporate, they're not going to be listening to you. So you're, you're going to be tuning out your audiences left, right, and center. And I said, so you need to be way more specific and then, and then move from there. If but you set somebody down on that path, it would be very difficult to do it on purpose, what you just described. Like, how can I be, how can I put out a message and make people not hear it? How can I camouflage what I want or need to say so that not a, there's no chance that a single person out there might find it a little bit interesting? Like it would be a hard project to do, but we do it when we flip it around. It's the easiest thing in the world. I'm going to be everything to everybody. And you come up naturally with a filter that means nothing to anyone. And you couldn't do it on purpose as well as we do it, um, you know, kind of back and in. Thank goodness you asked me this question and thank goodness you're we're discussing this now, not six months from now, when you're wondering why you have one subscriber and it's your mom. Yeah. No offense, mom, but we need more subscribers than just you. Thanks for your support. <laughs> he only gives you a three star. Right. Well, moms are brutally honest sometimes. They don't want you to, you know, grow up like those millennials to have. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets five stars. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, if somebody... Uh, wants to really get into the leveraging thing what should they be doing well read the book it's free um i built it to be a 200 hundred dollar product i'm now just building books to until they feel like i could charge in a specialty niche for some something around 200 dollars. i'm done with the book and then i give it away it's a stunt it works every time because people are like wow i can't believe this is the number one thing is i can't believe you're giving this away um and then something specific if they got anything out of it. So uh, it's at The Leveragists. Um, you can check out our podcast over there at theleveragists.com. Uh, or you can just type in Leverage Black Book and that'll get you to the book. And you can check out all the tactics. We talked about a 
30,000 foot view today, but uh, there, there's more specificity in the book itself. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the uh, name will be along the bottom here when, uh, when I edit this. And it'll be in the description as well. Cool beans. So, Jack, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to share this information. I think uh, this is really life-changing, and it certainly has helped me think of a few things, particularly a couple of projects where I was a little bit stuck. And, uh, uh, and it, so you got me moving on. I really appreciate that. Do you have one final tip you'd like to leave everybody with? Just think more. Give yourself the time to think more about the direct route to where you want to go and what that path might look like. In spite of all the things we put down in the beginning of this, and maybe you're gonna you're starting to reach for them again. It's like I got to get back to my stuff in this little stress ball of ideas that people gave me to do. Uh, I would just I would just say leave that down for as long as you can. And you know, it's like when you go through your house and start cleaning things out. You know, you 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 amass all of this junk that you really don't need. And like when you first bought your bigger house, you're like, we're never gonna be able to fill this up. And of course, now what is it? Every single room and every nook and cranny is full of stuff. So I, I would just say, let's do that cleansing. Let's do that again and get rid of all the junk that you've picked up. Might be, might have been good advice at the time. Might, might not be. If, if your re real goal is to get a direct route from here to your biggest goal for your business that you ever allowed yourself to imagine, um, most of the stuff that you're doing right now probably could be trimmed or altered in some way to make sure you stay or get back on that direct route. And leverage is really the key to all of it. I have to end with a hoarding story because you brought out the <laughs> house thing. And uh, I knew this guy a couple towns over who got married. And he was in his 60s or something, and she was in her late 50s or whatever. And he was a hoarder. And I didn't know that because I never went into his house. And the reason I never went into his house is he never invited me in. The reason he never invited me in was because there was a path about this wide through all the rooms. He It was piled up like crazy. So she marries him and she says, no more hoarding. And he is depressed for like a month. And then she starts cleaning out her, his house and it's a two story house. So she's on the second story and she grabs this and she takes it out. And she has a dumpster in the back because we're not talking about hoarding anything. of. We're talking about like newspapers from like 30 years ago sort of stuff. So she's clearing it out, clearing it out. And he's like looking and looking. And then finally, she gets to a wall and she starts pulling all the stuff down from the wall. On the other side of the stuff is a door. And you open the door and there's nothing there. Like it's the street, right? And she turns to him and she says, did you know that door was there? And he just like forgot, I guess. I, I don't know. Because now she's mad because she could have moved the dumpster under the door and just pushed everything out instead of having to <laughs> Nice. Did you know that door was there? So in other words, that's the leverage. You got all this junk that you've been hoarding and you've got to move everything like step by step, you know, one at a time sort of thing. Instead, you've got this door behind it, <clears throat> which has all the answers. And you mm -hmm. just go through there and you can get it done in a fraction of the time. Because she was spending like six months cleaning this house. This was not a, a couple hour job. Like, and at the end of six months, she finds the door. She just he was in the doghouse. He was. <laughs> yeah. So that was perfect. That's exactly what I'm saying. And, and, and another way to look at that is that that door is in all of your guys' house, so to speak. That yeah. door is there. There's a direct route. It, um, you know, while we might have been brought up and programmed to think that it's admirable to work really, really, really super hard, leverage us work hard. We work hard, but we don't usually call it work. From the outside, you would look at it finding what I do distasteful or not fun, but I find it very, very fun. You'd call it work and I'd call it fun. So we do work hard, but we don't work needlessly. We don't throw it in because of a badge of honor that we think we have to earn. Because that badge of honor is being a good dad and having enough time for my family and really things in life that matter on your deathbed that you're going to look back on and go, eh, I worked for the sake of work alone. No, yeah, well, that was wrong. I wish I would have had more time with my family, whatever. So, you know, that's, that's, why we, that's why I think it's one of the only things that is really the, it just goes to the source. What do we need to be talking about in business and success? 
It's how we get everything done as easily and efficiently and quickly as possible to achieve the goal, which we told ourselves that's what we wanted to do when we started our business. That's what we wanted to accomplish. Thanks. You've been uh, listening to Scott Patton and Jack Humphrey. Jack is the author of the Leverage Black Book, available at www.leveragist.com. Theleveragists.com. Theleveragists.com. And I'll get you to uh, uh, Facebook me the URL just so I make sure I put it in here correctly. So okay. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Appreciate you. Glad that you're along for the ride. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.